Oklahoma, Pate State 101, what do you need to know about Oklahoma coming into this year? I got three questions for him. The first is how much defensive improvement is it fair for me to expect? They were bad last year. Outside of just the record slapping you in the face and then barely making a bowl game in year one under Brent Venables, their defensive play left a lot to be desired. Almost in a strange way, they were so bad defensively, it was comforting. And that sounds crazy. What I mean is, if they were just kind of bad, you may look at it and say, oh, maybe Brenton Venables was just a little overrated. They were actually so bad defensively, it's almost like you look at it and say, oh, something was clearly wrong. It's If you're watching a NASCAR race and a car is three miles an hour off the pace, that's bad. If they're 30 miles an hour off the pace, you're almost less worried because you just know something mechanically is wrong and you'll fix it and you'll be better next week. They were 99th in points per game. They were 122nd in yards given up per game. There is newness everywhere on this team. They portaled and they portaled hard. Linebacker, defensive line, we're going to talk about that in a second. So if they're bad again this year, it will not be because they did not retool. They got a bunch of dudes. Peyton Bowen coming in there playing as a freshman probably. So they'll be different. They'll be new. They'll be more skilled defensively. I think it'll translate. My question is, what is fair to expect from them? Number two, question number two. Is there a wide receiver one on this roster? Because they lost Marvin Mims. That was the only 1,000-yard pass catcher they had last year. Lost a couple more of their top leading pass catchers, but they really only had one that stood out statistically, and he went in the second round of the NFL draft. So... Drake Stoops, he's on the roster. Jaleel Farouk, he's there. Andrew Anthony, they added him. Uh, Also, Jaden Gibson, they expect a lot out of him, but this is largely an unproven crop of players. Dylan Gabriel there to throw you the ball. Jackson Arnold waiting in the wings. So you are not going to be hurting at quarterback. It's just... How many pass catchers there can I defend on? Can I depend on? And is there is there a true wide receiver one in that room? That's what God created fall camp for. Question number three, who's right about Brent Venables? Strangely, although he's just one year into his tenure, there doesn't seem to be a lot of indifference on Brent Venables. There are people who believe in him, and there are people who have totally sold their stock on him. And there are not a lot of people where I am, which is just kind of in between. I don't think I have enough information on him yet. And there is a lot of wisdom sometimes in just taking a wait-and-see approach. It. It's really weird, though, because most of the time, people will just give you benefit of the doubt for a little while. There was kind of a a more knee-jerk reaction to Brenton Venables. I was, ironically, worried about talent acquisition. When he came to Oklahoma, some of you will remember me saying this. I was saying, I don't doubt that he can coach football. I don't doubt he'll put a good staff together. Will they be able to attack Texas? Will they be able to attack this new thing at the time called the transfer portal? Number four and number eight? Last year in those two rankings, number four and number nine this year in those two rankings. So they've been top 10 both of his years in recruiting and in portal rankings. I can find ways to reasonably explain away all of the bad stuff last year. Whether I'm right or wrong, as, it, as history will show us or as the future will show us, I can at least explain it away. Talent acquisition at least is not going to be a problem for them. So if they fail, if, if the people who doubt Brent Venables are right, They're going to be right solely because he can't coach. They're not going to be right, and this is one fear that's been alleviated, they're not going to be right because it turned out he couldn't go get the players. The best position group on this team, I could have said linebacker. I could have said safety. I actually went the pretty easy route. I went quarterback. Dylan Gabriel's there, and last year when he went down, 49 to nothing against Texas was the result. This year, you actually have one of the best quarterbacks out of last year's cycle in the room in Jackson Arnold. We saw him at Elite 11 last year. We'll be out there again in a couple of weeks, by the way. You know, I'll save that for next week. Um, Quarterback's a really good room here. But as I said, you know, Dylan Gabriel, if healthy, is the guy this year and should be the guy this year. The breakout candidate, though, that's where I go to another position group. Deshaun McCullough is a name you really need to know. Now, Oklahoma fans have probably already heard about him to the point that they feel like he's started there multiple years. No, he started at Indiana as a freshman, and he was a true freshman All-American and played in all 12 games 
for the Hoosiers as a true freshman. He tied for the team lead in sacks. 6'5", 230. He's going to play that cheetah position in Venable's defense. Deshaun McCullough is going to be a really, really good player for them. Keep an eye on him. And as for the schedule with Oklahoma, paper pop. According to the unofficial producer Jesse Metrics, Oklahoma has the second weakest schedule in the Big 12. Sound the alarm. Let me hit the pause button. Let me call one of my three timeouts per show. I didn't say Oklahoma has a weak schedule. I know some of you heard that. That's not what I said. I said relative to the rest of the Big 12, Oklahoma, you could make the argument, has the second weakest schedule amongst Big 12 teams. Did everyone catch that? Okay. For the record, we think Oklahoma State has the weakest. So something about the state there. They play seven of the bottom eight odds teams in the Big 12. So we line up the odds to win the Big 12. Seven of the bottom eight teams, Oklahoma plays them this year. They got Texas, as they always do, neutral site. They don't play Texas Tech. They don't play Kansas State. They don't play Baylor. They got Tulsa, Arkansas State, and SMU in non-conference play. Now, I don't want to gloss over SMU uh, because that's a really good team. They play in week two. Over-under win total, eight and a half for SMU. So that's not a gimme. But it's also not like Texas going to Alabama in week two. Oklahoma's over-under win total is nine and a half. This is going to be a radically different looking team this year. How much of that different is a good kind of different? And how much of that different is just, oh, it's the same result. It's just like a different route to get to the same result. I happen to think they'll springboard nicely this year. But I have some buddies whose opinions I trust who just totally disagree with me on that. We'll see.